Hello friends and welcome to another Del Boy 3K1 film retrospective and unboxing. Um, now I touched upon uh, several times where does the inspiration come to talk about a film and uh, this one is, was quite an easy one to choose in the end. Usually I have difficulty, you know, if, um, it usually comes from um, panning my eyes across my shelf or um, somebody mentions something or um, something comes on telly. Um, this one has actually crossed my path twice this week, uh, both from my friends. And I decided I'm going to cover it because it is an absolute fave film of mine. Um, and one that dates back quite a few years and many of the elements in this particular film um, have affected my life in some way. So what is this film? Well, I'm going to just point it at the camera now and then start discussing why this one is quite an important film for me. And it is Somewhere in Time uh, with Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour from... 1980 so I did actually see this film at the pictures and I have watched it on multiple times on the television usually around bank holidays um, usually or something on a Sunday afternoon it is that type of film um, it covers an awful lot of subjects which I mentioned at the beginning uh, I'm going to mention some of those subjects now and if this intrigues you then I definitely recommend that you watch this film so some of the subjects are power of the mind love obsession nostalgia agony loss death and mental health and if any of those excite you um, or intrigue you, then I definitely recommend this film. So I don't really want to go too much into what it's about um, because there, are, I tell you now, there are lots and lots of videos out there in regards to Somewhere in Time and most of them give it a thumbs up positive review, which basically I can tell you now I'll be doing the same at the end of this. But I will just give a little bit of an outline um, so this film starts off with Christopher Reeve, um, as Richard Collier celebrating, uh, a play that he's written, um, that has now, that has been on stage and after first night, um, is very successful. He's with all of the cast and crew, um, having a drink and having a laugh where an old woman suddenly walks through the crowd, past the cast, gets hold of Richard Collier, hands him a gold pocket watch and, whisp and says the words, come back to me. She then disappears and basically we follow her back to her hotel room where she sits down and dies that evening. So there's the hook right at the beginning we then find eight years has gone by and it's now 1980 which is present time for the film being made and present time in the film and Richard Collier is now a successful playwright and um, but he's got writer's block he doesn't know quite what to do so he decides to take himself away from where he normally writes and go to a hotel to actually see if he can get rid of his writer's block. It's a very old hotel, very beautiful hotel. And he um, realises that there used to be a theatre production and an actual theatre built onto this hotel. And some of the people that have played at this hotel have got their pictures in a, in a special memoriam uh, place in the hotel. So he goes into the room and he sees this picture of a beautiful lady 
on the wall. And it, he seems to recognise her, but can't have done, because the picture is from 1912. So he goes into the lobby and asks questions about it, and he finds out that this was a famous actress of the time uh, that had a promising career. Uh, but after a last production at the hotel, um, sort of like when it became recluse, and nobody knows why. Um, he then finds old uh, archive books at the hotel and sees the last picture of this actress and it happens to be the old lady that gave the pocket watch to him. He doesn't understand at this particular point how could he have known this lady? What did she mean, come back to me? So he starts to think that it must be some sort of time travel and decides to speak to his old college professor. His old college professor explains to him that there are many ways of travelling through time, and one of those ways would be the power of thought. Um, there have been case studies, apparently, uh, where if you surround yourselves with period pieces of the time, if you actually exclude everything about modern time, if you think only of that time, then you can power yourself back in time. Thinking that must be the only method, he decides to give it a try. He buys himself a, uh, a suit of a period of the time, um, goes to the oldest room uh, in the hotel, removes anything to do with any that, of anything that is past 1912, lies on the bed, and thinks to himself, it is 1912 and I am in this hotel. And there then is a strain where you see Richard Collier trying, but unsuccessfully traveling back in time. So he goes up to the attic in this hotel and looks at the old signing in books and turns to 1912 and around about the summertime and he had actually signed the guest book in 1912 so he must have traveled back in time so he tries once more and this time he succeeds and there then follows the love story um and it comes with the nostalgia um the loss and eventual mental health and, and death aspects of this film. It's a very, very romantic film, not really a science fiction film in regards to uh, traveling in time. It's a very unique way of thinking about time. But it's a very dark film. Um, and the most beautiful aspect of it is not only the people that play in this film. Um, and I have to mention um, Christopher Plummer is in this film as well. So you've got not only um, Jane Seymour and Christopher Reeve, you've got Christopher Plummer. And they all outstanding in this film. But you have a fantastic score by John Barry. And it was it was the score that got me the most when I first watched this film. And even now, it's it's one that I'll I'll constantly play. It's got a one classical piece of music in it on the album, which is Rhapsody on a Theme for Paganini, uh, by Rachmaninoff. Uh, generally piano pieces, uh, but it's a piano and strings basically piece, and very beautiful and and, and weaving in its and its motif um, and it suits the film so well um, later on uh, I found out that John Barry considered this film to be a very different type of score for him and he remembered that he composed the, fir the, the, the film shortly after his mother and father had died 
So his father went first and four weeks later, I think it was, his mother died as well. And it was the first piece of music he composed. This I found out in an interview in a soundtrack magazine, but it's also actually in the extras on the, on the DVD, uh, which I think is going to be a very nice touch. And really all I can say about the film is, is that it's, it's such, such a powerful piece, so, so thought provoking that I think a lot of people get a kick of it. I've always said that sometimes film can mimic real life. Um, there was a time um, at the very early stages of the of 2000 where I wanted to go over to the States. And I fell in love with a person I was chatting with uh, on a, in a Yahoo chat room. We became good friends. Uh, the person was in a not so good relationship um i went over to visit um we got on very well um we started talking about me moving over to the states uh i started the ball rolling in regards to getting lawyers to uh move over to the states but it was not to be and all in that space of time for me the, the the parallel lines with somewhere in time come through to me and so I suppose that's one reason or one of many on why I consider this film to be an absolute classic and uh we always do an unboxing if I haven't opened it already I've seen this film digitally on VHS on Laserdisc I've had it on DVD I've got it on Blu-ray and uh, as far as I know there is no 4k just to explain about the picture quality on this, I always wondered whether a 4K would suit this film. And I'm in two minds. One thing that you will notice about this film is, is that it's very, very sharp when it's looking at present day. But when he travels back in time and goes to 1912, there's a very soft lens that's used. And in certain shots, it's almost like they've smeared Vaseline over the lens to give it a sort of like oldish look about it, which I don't think would probably work very well with a 4K transfer. That being said, um, the Blu-ray is, an, is, a, is a very, very good transfer um, because I have actually seen it on Blu-ray. Um, but there's the case and the back. Just pulled the took, took the cover off of it open it up i don't think there's going to be too much in here and yes you've got no booklet and you've got a nice picture disc <clears throat> according to the back i believe it is region locked to region b i did check and it is available on amazon um it's not the cheapest disc out there but it's also not the most expensive if anybody is thinking about buying it, I would recommend buying the CD soundtrack at the same time. Uh, it is a beautiful score. Um, and really, that's my thoughts on somewhere, somewhere in Time. It's amazing how in the same week, several people have mentioned the same film. Um, and I think it's about time pun intended, uh, that I got round to watching watching this again. It's been a good couple of years. Um, so now that I've opened this, I think I'm going to sit down uh, with a nice tub of popcorn and a drink and settle back and get engrossed in a nice romantic film, which unfortunately has a very dark overtone. And with that, I'm going to say salute, eh? Hope you've enjoyed this and uh, look out for the next one. Bye-bye.